Good morning. Thank you for being here. Because of today, we're doing the Lord's Supper. We're going to not be just in John. I'm going to go somewhere completely different this morning because of the Lord's Supper and what it means to us today, I believe. So we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation and show you the big picture, the big story, and I'll try to do it in a timely fashion. Let's start in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And go to verse 15. Adam and Eve have already sinned in the garden. God is dishing out the punishments. The first one that's going to be punished or given the, the curse of sin, we're going to see it's given to Satan. But we also have the gospel written in this verse. This is the first gospel explained in the Bible. So let's read it. Genesis 3.15 and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I want to look at a couple things in this verse. It's talking about the gospel, and it's saying, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And he's talking to Satan. He's talking to the serpent here. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. It's talking about... Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to bruise, crush the head of Satan. Satan will, you see at the very end of verse 15, thou shalt bruise his heel. And that's going to be on the cross. And just so you'll know, it says, and between thy seed, that's the serpent, and her seed, that's the virgin Mary. Because the seed is not in the woman, the seed's in the man. So the virgin's going to have a child. The child is going to crush Satan's head. But Satan will be able to bruise his heel. And we're going to look at that through the picture of the Lord's Supper this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us to come together to corporately worship you through song, through the reading of your word, through the Lord's Supper. And Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And we're asking you just to, to teach us through your word what you would have for us to learn today. For it's in Christ's name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. We're going to come back to this verse at the very end, or at least allude to it. We may not open our Bible and read it, but we're at least going to allude to it. But go to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Genesis 12 and verse 1. You remember God here in Genesis 12 verse 1, He's speaking to Abram at this point. And He's telling Abram, He says, Now the Lord hath said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. I want to do something this morning. I want to talk to you and to us on this subject this morning. As we're going through the Passover, the lamb and the preparation for the meal. That's going to be our subject. The lamb and the preparation for the meal, the Passover meal. That's what we're going to look at. And the first thing that I want us to look at as we're going through the entire Bible, we're going to look at two things today. He's preparing a lamb for the Passover meal, but the first thing that I want us to see is what he's preparing for us in the Old Testament, he's preparing for a nation. He's preparing a nation. And that's why I wanted to read Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, because God's going to prepare a nation. The nation is going to be Israel, the Jewish people. 
and out of the nation is going to come the Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's where we're headed with this, this Passover, because he's going to prepare a nation first. And for that nation, there has to be a lamb prepared, and the blood has to be shed. Let's go to Genesis, I mean Exodus. We've been in Genesis. Let's go to Exodus, and we'll go to chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Just to give you a little background, God has asked Abram to get thee up and go to a country, which I'll show you. The country is the promised land. Now, it took him a long time to get there because God had to establish the country first and then he could take the country and they could go to the promised land. And whenever Joseph, remember he was sold by his brothers and sold into slavery, and he was, he was bought by the Ethiopians and sold into the Pharaoh family, and he went to Egypt. And then during the famine, his family showed up. And out of that, there was a nation born in Egypt. Whenever you look at Egypt in the Bible, every single time, it's speaking of the world. So when you see Egypt in the Bible, it's speaking of the world. And what God's going to do is He's going to call His nation out of the world and He's going to bring them to the promised land. So let's just look at, first of all, the Passover that we're going to be looking at. The way it originated is He's having a Passover, so He's bringing out a nation. That's the first Passover. Let's look at it. and We're in, we're in Exodus chapter number 12, starting at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for every house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his household next to him his house, take it according to the number of souls, every man according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. And verse 5 says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side post and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Now this is the first Passover. They're to take this lamb and they're to kill this lamb and take the blood and put the hyssop in the, into the blood and strike it and just paint the door post around. That's the image that we get here. Now look at verse 12. You're still in Exodus 12. Look at verse 12. And I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. So we see judgment. Mm -hmm. Who's going to pass through the land? God is. You know, you're growing up and you hear, well, the death angel's going to pass by that night. And whoever doesn't have the blood on the door, the death angel's going to smite the firstborn. Well, actually, it's God himself that's going to pass through because God's the only one that can judge. And God's going to pass through. That's why it says in verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Let's just read on down a little bit further. Verse 13, The blood shall be unto you for a token. It's going to be a sign unto you upon the houses wherein you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. That's mercy. I'm going to pass over you. And plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. That's where we get Passover. And today we're going to have the Passover meal. And you see, for the Passover, there had to be a lamb without spot, without blemish. And did you see it had to be taken in on one day and on the 14th day it had to be killed? The Passover lamb is not killed on Passover 
the Passover lamb is killed on the preparation day of Passover, which is the day before. That's going to be significant when we see Jesus Christ. He's not killed on Passover. Matter of fact, they had to take him off the cross before Passover began. His blood had to be shed on the preparation day of Passover, the same exact day that the sheep, the lambs, were killed in the temple. That's just a little side note as we go far further, because I want you to see what's going on. Look at verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. That's what we're doing here this morning. We're going to have the feast this morning. We're going to have the Lord's Supper, and we're going to remember what Christ has done on the cross. He's brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt. He's going to bring us out of Egypt. He's bringing them to the promised land. He's going to bring us to the promised land. And we have to keep our eyes focused on eternity and always be thinking of that. Look at the last couple verses that I want to show you in this part. It's verse 26. You're still in Exodus 12. Verse 26 and 27. Look at these verses. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? So when they're sitting around and they're observing the Lord's Supper like we are today, and the children ask, why are you doing this? You need to be able to give them an answer. Look at the answer. It's in verse 27. It says this, that you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, delivered our houses, and the people bowed their heads and worshipped. So that's the beginning of the nation of Israel. And at the beginning of the nation of Israel, there had to be a lamb that was prepared for sacrifice in order for them to be delivered. That's the Passover. That's the Passover at the beginning of a nation. I want to show you now the preparing of a bride for the Passover. The preparing of a bride for a Passover. We've seen the preparing of a nation. What about a bride? The church is the bride of Christ. And he's preparing us for the day that we are going to pass over into the other land, which is heaven. Matter of fact, in John 14, you know that he's gone to prepare us a place. And he's going to come back and get us because where he is, we shall be with him, it says in John 14. So go to John and chapter 6, and he is preparing a bride for the Passover. John chapter 6, and look at verse 4. We've gone from the first covenant, the law, to the second covenant, grace by Jesus Christ. And we're looking at John chapter 6 and verse 4, <laughs> just, to, just to give us a springboard to let us know where we are. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. So it's at hand. What time is it? Time for the Passover. Just as it was time for the Passover and the lamb was to be killed, and the people that had the blood on the doorpost, that the death would pass by them, if the blood is on us and it's covered us, death is going to pass us by as well. We're going to still be in John chapter 6, but go to verse 48. John 6, 48. And this is hard, hard, hard for the Jewish people to listen to. And they should have gotten it. And I hope we get it today. Look at verse 48. This is one of those I am statements that we looked at last week. And he says, I am the bread of life. In verse 48. Keep reading. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I'm thankful that it came down from heaven, aren't you? That's right. Because, see, we can't go to heaven. We can't get to where God is, so God had to come to where we are. That's right. So that bread, just like they were fed bread in the wilderness, they ate that manna which came from heaven, but they died because it wasn't the bread of life. It was the bread just to sustain them till the next day when they could eat again. Well, this bread's come down from heaven. And it says in verse 49, Your fathers did eat that man in the wilderness, and they're dead. 
This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that if a man eat thereof, and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. So why are we partaking of the Lord's Supper? Because of this right here. It's just remember what Christ has done. And even though we don't believe in the transubstantiation like some of Catholics do, they believe that the literal bread and the wine become the literal flesh and the blood of Christ. See, that's cannibalism. We don't believe that. We believe we do this as a symbol for what Christ has done. So let's just keep reading. And we're going to start there for... In verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? You see how they're kind of confused. So Jesus is going to answer them. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And, this is the good part, I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father, so he hath eaten me, even he shall live by me. And this is bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So that's why we're having the Lord's Supper, but it's just to remind us of what Christ has done. He came down so that we could live forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Go to chapter 18 as we're going to continue on this same thought. Chapter 18, you know in chapter 18, it's time for Jesus Christ to be crucified on the cross. Look at verse 38. John 18, verse number 38. John 18, verse 38. This is where we left off on our Sunday mornings as we're going through the book of John. Jesus Christ is having his unfair trials. <laughs> They're going to try to judge him by the law and they're breaking the law. Look at verse 38. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault at all. I find in him no fault at all. Let me just tell you a little bit about what's going on. It's time for the Passover. And during the Passover, the Jewish people would not go into the court system of the Romans. Because if they do, they think that they're going to be defiled. So that's why, you see there in verse 38, he had to go out again unto the Jews. Because they weren't in there with him. Jesus Christ was in there, but they would not go in because they didn't want to be defiled. Look at 39. Because three times we're going to see something. Three times. I find no fault in him at all. Look at verse 39. But you have a custom that I should release unto you one at a Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus, and he scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it in his head, and they put on a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. And when the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him. For 
I find no fault in him. Pilate's judged him, he's searched him, and he's found no fault in him. Why is that significant? Because remember John the Baptist. In John 1.28 says, Behold the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And now he is here in front of the inspector. The inspector's inspecting the Lamb and he finds him without spot. He finds him without blemish. And it's the 14th day of Nisan, the day of preparation, the day that, that the Lamb is to be slain for the sins of the world in the Old Testament and now in the New Testament. And what's the world saying? The world saying at this time, crucify him, give us Barabbas. Now get this picture. Can't you just picture this? Barabbas is in prison. And he can look up on the hill and see three crosses. He knows that the middle cross is his. The ones on the side are for common thieves. That one in the middle, it's for somebody that's committed murder, he's a robber, he's a thief, he's a liar, you name it, he's it. And Barabbas just knows that his life is over, he's headed for the cross, he's already been convicted and tried, he's just waiting his execution. And now the world is crying, give us Barabbas. And Barabbas means this. Bar means the son of, Abba is the father. He's the son of the father. And now you have your choice. Either the son of the father or the son of the father. One's the son of the world and one's the son of God. And they're saying, release unto us the son of the world. Give us him. Put the son of God to death. So Christ, they let Barabbas loose. Just get this picture. They come to get Barabbas. He knows he's going to the cross to die. He gets the key and undo, they undo the handcuffs. Sir, you're free to go. And here's Jesus headed to the cross that belonged to Barabbas to die. He died on somebody else's cross. Barabbas is a picture of you and I. And instead of us being on the cross, Christ took our place on the cross and we were set free, just like Barabbas. That's what's going on in this picture. And he's going to pass over all of us if we've trusted in Christ if we've accepted him and trusted him and the blood is applied to our life, then the death is going to pass by us. The next place that I would like for us to go. We're still in chapter 19 now of John. Go to verse 14. Verse 14, John 19, 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. It had to be the preparation day of the Passover at evening when Christ was killed. Because it had to fit the Old Testament time when the lambs were killed. But like I said, in this point, in preparation of the lamb for the Passover meal, this is the preparation for the bride for the Passover meal. So I want you to go to Ephesians 5. Let's go to Ephesians 5, and we're going to look at the Passover for the bride. This is how the bride's going to come out. Ephesians 5, let's start in verse 25. A lot of times we pastors like to use these verses for marriage. But to be honest, it's talking about Christ and the church, Christ and His bride. But we can also relate it to an earthly marriage between a man and a woman. So let's go to Ephesians 5 and verse 25, and let's look. 
Now I want you to get this picture. Christ is preparing a bride for himself. And it says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Now the church is his bride. And look at what he has done for his bride. And he gave himself for it. He's given himself for his bride, the church. The ones that trust in him and believe in him. Committed their lives to him and made him the Lord of their life. Look at 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You see what he's doing with his bride? He's cleansing her, just like they would do in the Old Testament. Before she was to get married, she was to be washed and bathed and cleansed and have spices put on her and make her ready for her husband. Now what's the church doing? We should be at this moment, since we are betrothed to the Lord, we're not at the marriage stage yet, we're just at the betrothal stage, but back in the Jesus day, the betrothal stage, the engagement stage was a legal binding marriage. You just didn't live together, you didn't come together yet. Nothing could separate you unless you sought for a divorce. Even in the engagement stage, the, the betrothal stage. So he's, what, what should the bride be doing? Making herself ready for the day that she meets the husband. Purifying herself, sanctifying herself, washing herself by the water, it says in verse 26, of the word. Right here, the Word of God. That's how you do it. Amen. That's what we should be doing. Preparing ourselves for the day that we're with Jesus Christ and we are at that wedding feast, which is where we're headed. The wedding feast. Look at verse 27. This is what Christ is going to do. That He might present it to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Isn't that something? Here's Christ. He's going to take something that's just awfully spotted, awfully blemished, and He's going to present it to Himself perfect without spot or without blemish. He's preparing you for the day that you get to heaven to be with Him. And I want to show you that day that you're with Him, the bride of Christ. You are going to one day be married to Jesus Christ. And I want to show you that time. Look at Revelation chapter number 19. Revelation 19. And let's start in verse 7. Revelation 19 and verse 7. I'm going to read this, I believe, like it's written. Because I can just imagine the joyous time of a, of a celebration of a wedding. <clears throat> Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. That's the church. Mm -hmm. Look at my, verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in and fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he shall, and he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Isn't that good? We're going to be up there with Christ. And he even told them at the last supper when he was in the upper room with them, I shall not eat or drink with you again until I get to heaven with you. So just as God prepared a nation for them, for himself, and out of the nation came the Savior, but he prepared that nation and he promised them the Holy Land. And they passed over into the promised land. One day we're going to pass over and we're going to go from this land unto our promised land, which is heaven. It even tells you in the book of Hebrews that, that Abraham looked for that city far off, talking about heaven. And we should be looking for that city afar off. We're going to pass over from here and we're going to pass over into heaven and we're going to be with Christ forever and ever and ever. 
Matter of fact, we're going to see the Lamb as He was slain. It tells us in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6 that we're going to see the Lamb as He was slain. And we're going to know that He was slain and that's the only way that we're able to be passed over through death and we know that it's the only way we're going to pass over to heaven and we're going to be with Him one day. Remember I told you we're going to go back to Genesis 3.15. You don't have to turn there. But I want to show you something. In Genesis 3.15, you remember God said, you're going to bruise his heel, but before that, he's going to crush your head. Look at John 19. Look at John 19. And this is when Jesus Christ is being crucified. Look at verse 17. John 19, 17, and he, bearing his cross, he went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. You remember in Genesis 3, 15, God promised Satan as a curse to him that Jesus Christ was going to crush his head. Where was the cross place? Golgotha. What does that mean? Skull. 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 Right. Here's the cross with Christ. And he is placed in the skull. And he crushed Satan's head. Amen. See, Satan's the prince of the power of this world. But Christ has defeated Satan. And that's why he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, we have victory through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Do you know Him today? Is He your Lord and Savior? Have you given your life to Him? We're about to partake of the Lord's Supper, and what we're doing is we're going to be reminded of what Christ has done for us on the cross. He's given us His flesh. He's given us His blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all you've done for us. We don't live for you because we have to. We live for you because we want to. We don't obey you because we just have to. We obey you because we want to. We don't just submit to you because we have to. We submit to you because we want to. Because when we listen to ourselves, when we submit to ourselves, when we obey ourselves, we mess up. And we've proven it over and over and over. But Lord, you have saved us from ourselves, you've saved us from sin, and you've given us a new life. Now we want to follow you, and your law is not grievous. And that's why we love you. We love you because you first loved us, and you demonstrated it, you proved your love for us because. While we were yet sinners, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.